Okay, let's uh, stand and pray real quick. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art ever present and fill us all things, treasury of good things, and giver of life, come dwell in us, cleanse us from your stain, and save our souls, O good one. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen. Amen. Well, we're on our second to last session in this series, the desert, uh, the desert, a city, and uh, I congratulate you all for persevering. As uh, you saw in the schedule, and as I sent out, tonight was supposed to be on Saint Piman the Great. However, I called an audible, and I switched him to next week. <coughs> Remember, at the end of last week, I said it would be an interesting night um, for St. Piman. That's because he has over 200 sayings. And I thought I could look through them all and figure out what I was going to do. But I didn't have enough time. So I'm giving myself an extra week. So uh, tonight, instead, we're going to be um, looking at St. Sincletiki or Sincletica. Um, she's the you know, only... Um, desert mother that we're looking at in this series, but I think uh, you'll hear a different kind of uh, tone in a way from her. Um, and if you've been to women's and men's monasteries, you'll uh, also know that you know there is definitely definitely a different kind of flavor um, in how each monastery kind of operates, their focus, what they focus on, these kinds of things. And I think um, as we read through her sayings, we'll uh, kind of get that same um, difference in flavors from the men to the women. So that being said, we'll open up like we have every week with the reading of her life from the Synaxarian. So on January 5th, we celebrate the memory of our venerable mother, Syncletica. Our holy mother, Syncletica, was born at Alexandria in the course of the fourth century to rich and devout parents who came originally from Macedonia. From her youth, she had been seen as an excellent match on account of her great beauty, intelligence, and virtues, and she had many suitors. But she remained deaf and blind to every worldly attraction, for she aspired only to spiritual marriage to Christ, the heavenly bridegroom. Bringing her flesh into subjection by fasting and austerities of every kind, she constantly gathered her spirit in the depths of her heart and cried out night and day, my beloved is mine and I am his. Song of Songs 2.16. On the death of her parents, she distributed her great fortune to the poor, and then, accompanied by her blind sister, she fled far from the city. She had her hair shorn by a priest, and thus consecrated herself to God forever, becoming the foundress of the monastic life for women as St. Anthony the Great was its institutor for men. Being already embarked on the works of Ascesis, she made rapid progress on the course which brings monastics to live a heavenly, heavenly life here below. And she took the greatest care to keep her contest hidden from human sight, lest she lose the final reward. She died daily to the world and to herself in order to live with Christ. And she rebutted with intelligence and discernment all the temptations insinuated by the demons. She raised herself constantly towards heaven by the holy virtues. And her renown spread round about her like a spiritual scent and attracted, despite herself, a growing number of fervent young women who came begging for her instruction and counsels for their salvation. At first, the saint refused out of humility to break her silence, but she was constrained at last by charity and gave way to their entreaties. 
With deep sighs, watered with tears, she revealed to them the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge that the Holy Spirit had set in her heart. In the first place, St. Syncletica re reminded her disciples that charity, perfect love of God and neighbor, is the fulfillment of the divine law in both the Old and the New Testaments, and that for those who withdraw from the world, it must be the origin and aim of every action. We shall be blessed, she said, if we, make such a, if we make as much effort to please God and to win heaven as people in the world do to heap up riches and corruptible goods. The delicate flower of holy charity blossoms only in a body and soul kept chaste and pure, not for, only from sins of the flesh and of the senses, but also from all connivance at the impure thoughts with which the devil relentlessly assails warriors in the army of Christ. Hence, they must always be on their guard, showing themselves as wise as serpents in order to foil the devices of the enemy, and by their purity, they must be as simple as doves. Just as clothes are washed and cleansed by treading them underfoot and turning them over and over, we should give ourselves up to poverty and to the ascetic life with the same expectation, joining vigilance, discernment, earnest prayer, and holy humility to mortification of the flesh in order that the soul receiving the Holy Spirit may become like a clean white dove which rises up to God. The saint herself had shown how to advance in humility, the basis of charity, by her hidden life, withdrawn from the world. As treasure is seized and squandered by thieves as soon as it is discovered, she said, so virtue fades and vanishes in the very moment that you make it known. Praise relaxes and enfeebles the soul like fire melting wax while insults and scorn raise the soul to the height of virtue. She added an evocative comparison of the ascetic life with fire. She said, when you light the fire, at first the smoke makes your eyes sting and stream with tears, but soon after you enjoy the welcome warmth. In the same way, we have to kindle within us through tears and sufferings, the fire of divine love, which Christ has promised to bring on the earth in order to rejoice afterwards in the consolation of the Holy Spirit. The luminous teachings of the saint filled the young women who listened to her with burning zeal. No longer willing to leave her, they desired to remain at her side day and night in order to contemplate in her person a living image of evangelic perfection. After resisting their pleas for some time, she resigned herself to the will of God and guided her growing community along the narrow way to the kingdom of heaven as one pilots a boat between reefs. She exhorted her disciples to adorn themselves with spiritual raiment in awaiting Christ with the same care as a bride devotes to preparing herself for an earthly union. She taught those who lived in community to prefer obedience and the casting away of their own opinions or judgments to feats of ascesis. And she exhorted them to, to encourage and to correct each other by word and above all by example in order to clear, keep clear of the snares of the evil one laxity on the one hand and vainglory on the other, because this is how to advance with moderation and discernment on the royal road of humility. Although her body was weakened and withered by fasting, the soul of Syncletica was illumined by Christ, the son of righteousness, and she shone brilliantly in her holy teaching, in her infallible discernment before which all the illusions and machinations of the devil took flight, and above all, in her constant progress towards perfection. In her latter years, to the free will offering of Ascesis, she added patience and illnesses. For she was put to the test by continual fevers and lung troubles, which like, a fire, which, which, like a file, slowly worn down her body. When she reached the age of 85, the devil put her to a final test, having obtained from God the power to submit her for three and a half years to suffering such as righteous Job's Righteous Job had endured for 35 years. While he attacked Job and the holy martyrs from without, he struck at the saint with the same savagery but from within, burning her entrails by her cancer as in a slow fire, which caused her excruciating pain. She bore these trials with patience and thanksgiving and even made use of them to instruct her disciples, saying, if illness strikes us, let us not be distressed as though physical exhaustion could prevent us from seeing God's praises. For all these things are for our good and for the purification of our desires. Fasting and ascesis are enjoined on us only because of our appetites. 
So if illness has blunted their edge, there is no lo longer need for ascetic labors. <clears throat> to endure illness patiently and to send up hymns of thanksgiving to God is the greatest ascesis of all. The devil would not admit defeat, though, and he took away her power of speech, depriving her of a formidable weapon of her word. But simply to see the serenity of the saint's countenance amid such great sufferings replaced every other teaching and strengthened those who approached her in the love of God. He then attacked her body with gangrene, and the stench of the putrefaction was so great that in order for her disciples to stay near her, they had to fumigate the air with much perfume and to anoint her decaying limbs with sweet spices as if for a corpse. But nothing could have subdued the weak woman who had become, by the grace of God, more valiant than any warrior. Scorning death and the impotent devices of the evil one, she was ministered to by the angels and was able to contemplate with joy the glory beyond all utterance of the light of paradise. In this way, at the end of a three-month martyrdom, she departed to the Lord to receive the crown of her contests, after having predicted the day of her death and consoled her disciples in her last words to them. <clears throat> you know what we see in the lives of uh, women ascetics? The desert, these desert mothers, um, or, you know, as the centuries go on, women in monastics, we see this uh, kind of rivaling of, you know, the feats of what men can do. And so we even hear hymns in the church that, um, you know, sometimes when we're speaking about a woman's faith, that we'll say they had manly courage. Because they became strong, they, be, uh, they didn't care about anything else. They uh, let themselves uh, be put to the test and overcame all the traps of the enemy. You know, it's really beautiful because it's not typically what we think about when we think about the women. Women are supposed to be, you know, beautiful, you know, gentle, delicate, you know, these kinds of things. But when we see in these lives of the women. Uh, Ascetics, we see women who are, uh, you know, in a good way, bucking the trend. Um, you know, they're trying to like become like men in the good way, not how uh, feminists would have it today. Um, so you can kind of uh, you you see a very much a similarity in the spirit of the women ascetics to compared to the men. But you now as we get into the sayings, I think we'll see a little bit uh, different um, in how they actually say what they say and kind of what their focus is. So with that, we open up to her sayings. So we have 27 recorded sayings. And I've... Uh, I picked out 19 of them. So here we go. Saying one, Ama Sincletica said, in the beginning there are a great many battles and a good deal of suffering for those who are advancing towards God and afterwards ineffable joy. It is like those who wish to light a fire. At first they are choked by the smoke and cry and by this means obtain what they seek. As it is said, our God is a consuming fire. So we also must kindle the divine fire in ourselves through tears and hard work. You know, this is uh, kind of like anything in life, especially in the spiritual life. If we want to reap the reward, we have to do the work beforehand. So if a man wants to get a wife, he has got to put the work in. He's got to actually have a job, you know, first and foremost. He's got to find the woman, pursue her, and uh, win her over. You know, if uh, a man wants to, you know, get more money or whatever, wants to be able to support his family or himself better, was he, he puts his head down and he works harder at his job so that he can get a raise or, um, you know, a, uh, what are those called? Promotion. Promotion, yeah. I never got one of those. 
But, you know, this is, and it's the same with the spiritual life. If we want the good things that the Lord will give to us in the future, we have to put our heads down and put in the work now. The problem is that, you know, Christianity isn't the best, you know, it's not, not the most marketable things, you know. You say, okay, you're going to have paradise. You're going to be with God and his saints forever. And it's going to be wonderful and beautiful. There's not going to be tears. not going to be any heartache or troubles. But in this life, you have to endure all the heartache, troubles, tears. You know, not only what's involuntarily placed on us from outside, but we even go so far as to ask our people to, you know, enter into the ascetic life and voluntarily place on themselves, you know, their own hardships with fasting and, you know, increased prayer and, you know, coming to the church services, all these things, you know. But, uh, you know, without the work, there's not going to be any reward. Saying too. She also said, We who have chosen this way of life must obtain perfect temperance. She's talking about the ascetic life, you know, the monastic life. It is true that among seculars, those who are in the city, also temperance has the freedom of the city, but intemperance cohabits with it because they sin with all their other senses. Their gaze is shameless and they laugh immoderately. So sometimes, most of the time, probably when we think about temperance, the virtue of temperance, we're thinking about, you know, what we're actually putting into our body, you know, drinking, um, like alcohol or what we're eating, how much we're eating. Um, but to be temperate, um, as she's saying, involves the whole person so that she brings up the way our eyes move about and also how much we laugh, you know. There is intemperance in all of our senses. All of our senses. If we overindulge our eyes in sights that we ought not, um, or if we, as she says, laugh immoderately, as if you know there's nothing to be sober about in this life. Um, you know, temperance involves the whole person, not just you know what we put in our mouth. Um, I had an example, but I forgot the example. So, moving on. <laughs> Saying three. <clears throat> she also said, Just as the most bitter medicine drives out poisonous creatures, so prayer joined to fasting drives evil thoughts away. So, maybe you've heard, or now you're going to hear, but... Um, you know, fasting without prayer, you know, is like the fast of the demons because they don't eat, but they also don't pray, you know. And so whenever we fast, we're called to pray more. We're called to um, bolster ourselves, support ourselves more in prayer because... Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we're supposed to kind of be um, sustaining ourselves on a deeper level when we're fasting. And if we don't have that prayer, you know, our fasting is not going to be very helpful and might even be, be harmful um, to our spiritual well-being. Um, and so when we're fasting, we're using self-denial. We're trying to deny ourselves not only what we eat and how much we eat, but hopefully, um, you know, how and what things we're doing and saying. Um, and then we add prayer, contemplation to God. So hopefully we're denying ourselves those things that may be good, um, like in the case of you know various kinds of food, or maybe bad, like in case of various sins that we're hopefully over trying to overcome when we're fasting. 
And then we add to that prayer, you know, contemplation of God. We're filling ourselves with something else that while we're at the same time, we're denying ourselves. Um, and this is, she is saying, the path to getting rid of destroying evil thoughts. Because we're learning how to deny ourselves those thoughts and then replace those thoughts with something greater, you know, prayer. Saying seven. She also said, Many are the wiles of the devil. If he is not able to disturb the soul by means of poverty, he suggests riches as an attraction. If he has not won the victory by insults and disgrace, he suggests praise and glory. Overcome by health, he makes the body ill. Not having been able to seduce it through pleasures, he tries to overthrow it by involuntary sufferings. He joins to this very severe illness to disturb the faint-hearted in their love of God. But he also destroys the body by very violent fevers and weighs it down with intolerable thirst. If, being a sinner, you undergo all these things, remind yourself of the punishment to come, the everlasting fire, and the sufferings inflicted by justice. And do not be discouraged here and now. Rejoice that God visits you and keep this blessed saying on your lips. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but he has not given me over unto death. Psalm 118, 18. You were iron, but fire has burnt the rust off of you. If you are righteous and fall ill, you will go from strength to strength. Are you gold? You will pass through fire purged. Have you been given a thorn in the flesh? Exult and see who else was treated like that. It is an honor to have the same sufferings as Paul. Are you being tried by fever? Are you being caught by cold? Indeed, Scripture says, We went through fire and water, yet thou hast brought us forth to a spacious place. Psalm 66, 12. You have, draw, you have drawn the first lot. Expect the second. By virtue, offer holy words in a loud voice. For it is said, I am afflicted and in pain. Psalm 69, 29. By this share of wretchedness, you will be made perfect. For he said, the, Lord's he the Lord hears when I call him. Psalm 4, 3. So open your mouth wider to be taught the, by these exercises of the soul, seeing that we are under the eyes of our enemy. And there's so many things to point out here in this saying. Number one, do you see here, you know, how versed she is in the Psalms? Um, she quoted like four or five different Psalms just in that saying. This is a good practice for us Orthodox Christians. Um, to uh, work in our work into our own spiritual um, lives, you know the reading of Psalms. Um, I tried to. So the Psalter is the book of the Psalms that we use in the church. It's split up into <coughs> twenty kathismata. Kathismata is the Plural of kathisma. So there are 20 kathismata in the Psalter. And it's divided so that, and organized in such a way that there, you know, there's a schedule of reading so that um, you can read the Psalter um, once every week. So you have, beginning Saturday night, you have uh, the first kathisma, which is Psalm 1 through 8. And then, you know, it's split up, you know, kind of uh, as much as they can, like evenly throughout the rest of them, um, through all 20. And then one year I tried to follow that um, schedule, you know, every day, every week, <clears throat> so that I was reading. In general, you read, if you follow that schedule, outside of Lent, you read it three kathismata, uh, a day. So there's typically two read at Orthros and one at Vespers. And while I haven't done that since, I, it really made it, its mark and imprint on my mind so that um, when I, whenever I read the Psalter now, you know, the words seem familiar to me. I mean, I couldn't quote offhand like she could. Um, but the words are still familiar, and I can 
kind of remember for the most part, you know, what's being said um, without actually, you know, just if I just read the first few words or something. Um, you know, it's something I need to do, you know, at least maybe not to the same degree, but, you know, on a more um, regular basis, uh, getting the Psalter and trying to memorize those Psalms again. Um, but, you know, the memorization of the Psalms, the um, reading of the Psalms is an ancient Christian uh, practice, and it would be good for us to for our own part to try a little bit to do the same so we can kind of get familiar again with those beautiful hymns. Um, another thing to point out from this saying, she talks about how, you know, the evil one, he goes, tries you with this temptation. If that doesn't work, he tries the opposite. You know, if, uh, um, you know, he tries you the temptations with insulting you and you're not, um, moved by it, he'll try to it's the temptations of praising you so that you can be vainglorious. You know, we could we have to understand that the evil one, he's been doing this a long time. He knows the traps that most people fall into, and so he's very uh, well versed at trying to get getting people to fall and to um, to sin, and it's very important. Um, during those times like she's talking about, to remind ourselves of the righteous who have gone before us, who have also gone through these trials and temptations. Maybe not the exact same, but similar, um, so that we can be encouraged, be strengthened, and say to ourselves, you know, if they did it, I can do it too. I can pass through these traps of the evil one just like they did. And it's important that if we don't and we fall, that we also remind ourselves with the righteous who repented and got back up and tried again. Saying eight. She also said, if illness weighs us down, let us not be sorrowful, as though because of the illness and the prostration of our bodies, we could not sing. For all these things are for our good, for the purification of our desires. Truly fasting and sleeping on the ground are set before us because of our sensuality. If illness then weakens this sensuality, the reason for these practices is superfluous. For this is the great asceticism, to control oneself in illness and to sing hymns of thanksgiving to God. So the reason that we do and practice asceticism, fasting, prayers, bows, prostrations, these kinds of things. It's to tame our passions by taming our body. You know, if it's through prayer, we're trying to take control of our mind and tame our wild, distracted mind. You know, if it's through prostrations or standing in prayer, we're trying to take control of our body and weaken it to show that it is the lesser part of, the, of us and our soul is greater. But, you know, the same thing with fasting. We're not allowing our animal appetites to overtake us, but we're con learning to control ourselves so that our soul can regain its correct place. But she's saying that if one is sick, and she, here she's talking about like the sicknesses she went through, like chronic illnesses, debilitating illnesses, not having a cold, you know. Um, she's not talking about, you know, having a little cough. She's talking about some like real illness, real sickness that, you know, really takes it out of a person, you know, makes them bedridden or whatever. She's saying, if one is experiencing an illness like this, there's no need to do those ascetic labors because what the ascetic labors are trying to accomplish, the illness is accomplishing. She says, instead, if you're sick, what we have to do is bear that illness with patience. You know, we have to take control of ourselves, she says. We have to don't allow ourselves to think that God isn't in control, allowing this illness to happen. Um, so we take custody of ourselves and endure patiently 
and we persevere through the illness. And at the same time, she says, we sing hymns of thanksgiving to God for allowing it to happen to us. And she said, that's a greater form of asceticism than all the ascetic practices that we try to do voluntarily. You know, and we see this practically in the church. Um, after, when a, a woman is pregnant, after she has a child, um, we don't insist that she fasts um, because what's being done to her body, you know, the violence, so to speak, of growing a child and then having a child and then recovering from having a child, you know, her body has been humbled. So we don't insist on um, pregnant and, uh, you know, new mothers um, to fast. We understand that, you know, their body has been humbled in a far different way and sometimes a greater way um, than, you know, uh, what fasting could do. Unfortunately, we, um, you know, we, if a woman wants to fast, she can, we should welcome to fast if she can endure that. You know, but, you know, Internet orthodoxy as it is, you know, there's certain, uh, I'll say one certain group on Facebook that I know of that is a uh, cornucopia of bad information. Um, and, you know, if you go there, you're definitely going to get a wrong answer. And they often, my wife will show me, you know, they'll say, oh, you don't have to fast, you know, don't even talk to your priest, you know, they're like get doling out this spiritual advice about this or that topic, but, you know, that's one of those things that they said, don't, you don't have to fast, you know, um, if you're pregnant. Um, so, be careful on the internet and Facebook. Most people are wrong. <laughs> or at least most people, uh, you know, want to be the spiritual father of you know, a Facebook group. Beware. <laughs> Saying nine. She also said, when you have to fast, do not pretend illness. For those who do not fast often fall into real sicknesses. If you have begun to act well, do not turn back again through constraint of the enemy. For through your endurance, the enemy is destroyed. Those who put out to sea at first sail with a favorable wind. Then the sails spread, but later the winds become adverse. Then the ship is tossed by the waves and is no longer controlled by the rudder. But when in a little while there is a calm and the tempest dies down, then the ship sails on again. So it is with us when we are driven, da driven by the spirits who are against us. We hold to the cross as our sail and, and so we can set a safe course. So um, she's saying what I alluded to in a couple of sayings ago, that don't pretend to be sick and don't uh, say, oh, I have a cold, I can't fast, got a little cough, a little flu, you know, I can't do that. You know, you, that's another thing you'll hear online too, you know, if you're sick, you don't have to fast. Well, you know, I don't know who told you that. Um, but we see... Um, she also says that if you know you you're, you come to get well from your sickness, don't all, at the other you know on the other hand use that as an excuse. Say, oh, I'm I'm still a little bit sick, even though you're you know feeling well enough. Um, to not fast it also, so you have like both uh, both extremes in this. Basically, don't use excuses. Don't make excuses for yourself. Um, you know, be realistic. Um, you know, I would say, and I think she would agree, but also don't, you know, make every decision on your own. I mean, this is why we have priests. This is why we have spiritual fathers. This is why we have, you know, godparents even to help us figure things out. Um, and, if, you know, if you're really sick, of course, you know, you might, want, might not want to eat anything anyways, but, um, you know, we don't... Try to make all these decisions on our own, and then we don't, shouldn't try to make excuses for, you know, not doing what we're asked to do. The saying 11. She also said, imitate the publican, and you will not be condemned with the Pharisee. Choose the meekness of Moses, 
and you will find your heart, which is a rock, changed into a spring of water. So obviously, uh, in the first half of this, she's talking about the parable of the public and the Pharisee. You know, that beautiful parable of uh, being truly humble before God. And pu- the publican couldn't even raise his eyes towards heaven, it says. But he just beat his breasts, um, asking God to have mercy on him because he knew he was a sinner. Whereas you had the Pharisee, on the other hand, who, you know, prayed. Not a, we, we can... We don't have to say he prayed, he uh, rather praised himself instead of praying to God about all the wonderful things he did um, and how he wasn't like the publican. It's just saying imitate his, the publican's humility. Um, we have to remember also that the, the Pharisee, he, I mean, he did good things. But he did them for the wrong reasons. He did them so that he can praise himself um, and say, "Oh, I did this and that." You know, that's why we're not. That's not why we do the things we do. Um, so we imitate the publican's humility, not his way of life, but his humility at that moment, and uh, we eschew the uh, Pharisee's pride. Um, and also, she says, imitate the meekness of Moses. And uh, she gives us this beautiful image that when the Israelites were wandering in the desert and they needed, um, there was no water to drink. And uh, God told Moses to strike the rock with his staff. And once he did that, the water poured forth from the rock so that it could um, satiate the Israelites in the desert. You remember, St. Paul also says, that rock was Christ. He doesn't say that rock was an image of Christ, or that rock was like Christ, or like what Christ did. He said that rock was Christ. Um, And it was an image of how Christ would pour out, you know, um, an Old Testament, you know, sign of how, what Christ would do in the New Testament, um, in fullness. But, you know, this meekness in Moses. Remember, meekness is not uh, weakness. You know, it's a very easy thing to remember. Meek, not weak. Um, rather, meekness is, you know, still having the strength, but allowing yourself um, to be submissive to, you know, someone else, to um, humble yourself before someone, um, sub- and submitting to the events of life as they are the will of God, you know. And so if we can be meek like Moses, if we can be meek in general, I mean, blessed are the meek, for they should inherit the, the earth. Um, if we can be meek, we can, um, you know, change our hard hearts into something soft and that's uh, life-giving. Um, and we can really exhibit that virtue from the Beatitudes. Saying 12. She also said, It is dangerous for anyone to teach who has not first been trained in the practical life. For someone who owns a ruined house receives guests there, he does them harm because of the dilapidation of his dwelling. It is the same in the case of someone who has not first built an interior dwelling. He causes loss to those who come. By words, one may convert them to salvation, but by evil behavior, one injures them. So, she's saying what's more important is that someone is, has their inner man, their interior life put together, and that they're actually um, practicing, you know, the gospel, and they have a real, true spiritual life, that they're... Um, Interior life and their conduct is in accord with Christ. Um, And it's not so much as important as what someone may know. know, This is kind of like the double-edged sword of the seminary. We go, hopefully, to train priests, but all we do is just give them information to learn. Um, Very rarely, you know, we're trying to form them as spiritual people. 
Um, you know, rather we're oftentimes just giving them information to learn. Um, you know, this is <laughs> going back to my point about internet orthodoxy. This is what we, I mean, then we see people who don't have the interior life and they don't have the, <laughs> you know, the education either. And they want to be teachers of people. We should never seek to be teachers in general because we know from the words of our Lord that those who teach will have a greater condemnation. Um, so we should always, I mean, obviously in certain areas of life, like a husband is called to teach his wife and his children. Um, you know, a boss is called to teach, you know, his employees, these kinds of things. <clears throat> so there are natural ways in which we are teachers in life, but according to the faith, you know, we have hopefully only people who are qualified, that is qualified at least in the spiritual life, not necessarily in education, but in the spiritual life to be teachers. They have to have learned by experience so that they can pass that experience on. Um, because we know that the life in Christ is not just ideas and thoughts. Um, moreover, it's um, something that takes place in the heart, in the soul of a person. Saying 13, she also said, it is good not to get angry, but if this should happen, the apostle does not allow you a whole day for this passion. For he says, let not the sun go down, Ephesians 4.25. Will you wait till all your time is ended? Why hate the man who has grieved you? It is not he who has done the wrong, but the devil hates sickness, but not the sick person. I like this. It is good not to get angry, but, you know, if you do get angry, you know, giving a, a lesser people a little allowance. Um, you know, she says not to, do to, to rather to follow the apostles um, in Junction and not let the sun go down our anger. But she's also saying, but if you're angry, why do you want to, you know, take all the time, you know, take all day to dwell on that anger? You know, whatever, whatever happened. Um, because, you know, sure that person made you angry, but it's not the person per se. You know, they have been abused themselves by the evil one. They fell into temptation first that, you know, for whatever reason, hurt you. And then now you've been hurt, you know, and you fall into temptation, you know, so that, you know, you feel wronged and then you become angry at the person, blah, blah, blah. And it's just this cycle. She's trying to um, redirect our thoughts to the reality of what's um, actually happening. You know, it's not the person. So every person, you know, in as much as they strive or don't strive in the spiritual life, um, you know, can be influenced by, you know, the suggestions of the demons. And she's, that's what she's saying. It's not, you know, it's not that person. He was just influenced. He fell prey just like you fell prey. Saying 14. She also said, those who are great athletes must contend against stronger enemies. So what she's saying is that those who are more advanced in the spiritual life face harder times in the spiritual life. Demons are, come, are going to come at them harder and stronger, which makes sense because the demons don't want to see anyone advancing more and more in the spiritual life. On the opposite side, we also need to think if we are just kind of coasting through life and nothing is really happening and we don't really have any temptations or whatever, we should probably say to ourselves, I'm not doing enough or anything at all because I have no uh, friction in my life. I've got no temptations coming to me, so the demons are probably not worrying about me because I'm kind of uh, being a lazy person right now. So um, we need to, you know, examine ourselves, see what's going on, um, 
And I mean, it's not like we want to invite temptation. You know, the temptation should naturally come from the demons because hopefully we're naturally advancing in the spiritual life. Um, but if we don't have any temptation at all, it's probably because we're not worth trying <laughs> to uh, tempt. Saying 15, she also said, there is an asceticism which is determined by the enemy and his disciples practice it. So how are we to distinguish between the divine and royal asceticism <clears throat> and the demonic tyranny? Clearly through its quality of balance. Always use a single rule of fasting. Do not fast four or five days and break it in the following day with any amount of food. In truth, lack of proportion always corrupts. While you are young and healthy, fast, for old age with its weakness will come. As long as you can, lay up treasure so that when you cannot, you will be at peace. So she's uh, calling people to have balance in their life. She's warning against, she gives the example of fasting for a number of days, and then at the end of those days, gorging yourself, just eating whatever you want, you know, as much as you want, and that those, you know, days before are totally ruined. Um, she's saying, rather, have the balance, be um, moderate, you know, at all times, just like we ask in the church, you know, we're not asking, except for you know, in the case of clean week, where it's traditional, where you have a complete fast from Monday through Wednesday, that's the only time in the church that we ask that. And not even, you know, we don't say it's a rule, but for those who want to piously try to do that, we encourage it to fast, you know, no food or drink from Monday through Wednesday of clean week, you know, the first week of Great Lent. That's the only time the church would ever, you know, ask or encourage, you know, a person to do that. For the rest of the time, you know, as we know, and we're about to start, you know, we have a very moderate fast. We fast from certain kind of foods, but we don't say how much we can eat or don't eat, you know, because everyone is different, you know, so it's that we're keeping ourselves as much as we need to, you know, sustained, and not overdoing it, you know, this or that day. You know, it's not, uh, we don't, the, we're not trying to gorge ourselves, you know, at the, on the weekends or something. But hopefully we've sustained ourselves enough during the week that we can just eat a normal amount on the weekend. And another important point that she's saying is that when you're young, you have the strength to do this stuff. You have the strength to fast. You have the strength to pray. You have the strength to make prostrations. You have the strength to, you know, stand in church for a, a while. You have the strength to, you know, do all these um, things. But as you get older, you start losing that strength, you know. Things start kind of falling apart. Um, and it gets harder to do these things. So she's saying when you're young, do the work, put it in. She says, lay up treasure for yourself so that when you're older and you can't do it anymore, you know, you have the capital to work off of. You know, you've already done the work and you can kind of, in a way, live off of that work that you've already done. You know, you don't say to yourself, oh, I, you know, I didn't do this when I was younger and now I need to, but I can't. Okay, I'm grouping the next two together, 16 and 17. So I'll read them first and then I'll comment on them. 16. She also said, as long as we are in the monastery, obedience is preferable to asceticism. The one teaches pride, the other humility. 17. She also said, we must direct our souls with discernment. As long as we are in the monastery, we must not seek our own will, nor follow our personal opinion, but obey our fathers in the faith. So both these are talking about obedience. And the monastic obedience that we've talked about before how it's different from obedience that we ask in the parish a normal parish church um, but she says that obedience is greater than asceticism it's preferable to it because she says one teaches pride so that not that it teaches it but the temptation comes with so that if we're doing the ascetic deeds or you know we're fasting 
We're doing, you know, however many prostrations. We're doing all these prayers and everything. There's the temptation to think that we're doing something great. That we're doing something with our own strength and not with the help of God. That's the temptation that asceticism brings. But obedience, on the other hand, um, doesn't bring into temptation, but it brings humility. It's, uh, we allow ourselves to be under someone so that we um, don't serve ourselves, as, like she says in you know, the second one. We try to get over our own will. Um, that we're not always thinking about ourselves and that brings us humility. And this is the same thing that we have in family life as well. You know, so in the church we have two paths of life. We have the married life in the world and we have the monastic life. You know, the celibate life. Ideally, the monastic life is in a monastery <clears throat> where you're in obedience to an abbot or an abbess. And, you know, and there are you know, various other monks who are in charge of various other things. But the abbot is over everyone, kind of making all the decisions. And everyone is obedient to his decisions so that they're learning to put their own will to death. On the other hand, the married life is we're doing the same thing. The wife is to be obedient to her husband. And the husband is supposed to die for the wife just as Christ died for the church. You know, it's this image of both people, you know, making a prostration to each other and seeing who can go lower. You know, in both married and monastic life, the monk and the married person are trying to die to themselves, to not serve themselves, but exalt the other above themselves. And this is even you know, more so when kids come into the question in family life. So then you have not only your spouse, but then you have these other little tyrants running around who want everything from you, um, that you have to uh, you know, learn to take a deep breath and uh, you know, listen to them even when they're being crazy. And we're trying to, um, as much as we can, <laughs> you know, not serve ourselves in those moments, but, you know, pour out ourselves for the betterment of our family. So obedience in monastic life, obedience in the married life. You know. Next, saying 18. She also said, it is written, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Being like serpents means not ignoring attacks and wiles of the devil. Like is quickly known to like. The simplicity of the dove denotes purity of action. So she's interpreting that saying of our Savior to be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. She's saying that we have to in our knowledge, we need to understand how the devil acts and what he does to try to get us to fall. So that when we see it coming, we can recognize what's going on and then escape. You know, so, um, but we can't do that if we're not actually trying to educate ourselves, you know, in kind of that spiritual combat. Um, and this is kind of Partly why we have these classes where you can kind of interject some, you know, hopefully something good here and there so we can learn a little bit more. Um, but then when we're as wise as a serpent, we can maintain the innocence, hopefully, that we have. So we can, because then we can escape um, and remain innocent and rather, and then falling into temptation. Saying 19. Ama Sincletica said, There are many who live in the mountains and behave as if they were in the town, and they are wasting their time. 
It is possible to, possible to be a solitary in one's mind while living in a crowd, and it is possible for one who is a solitary to live in the crowd of his own thoughts. So she's saying that your location does not designate your spiritual disposition. Just because you're off in the desert fasting and praying doesn't mean that you're actually in the desert fasting and praying if your mind is still in the city thinking about, you know, the markets or, you know, this or that store, you know, or, you know, all the entertainments, whatever. And at the same time, if you're in the city, but your thoughts, your you're dwelling on God, you're dwelling on, you know, those beautiful things of the spiritual life, you're not actually in the city, you're somewhere else. So our location and where we're working out our salvation is not as, as important as what is actually, you know, we're doing um, with what we have where we are, you know. And this, you know, I think there's, you may have even heard this story, I can't remember exactly, um, I've heard it in multiple different places, but you have the story of um, a priest is going through the church, you know, from Vespers or whatever, sensing, and they're sensing everything, and there's a person, you know, the, all the, it's kind of like in a, you think about like holy archangels, you have all the stasidia, the stalls, he's going through, he's sensing each one, they're all empty, because it's like, no one's there really, and then there's one person that, you know, in the stall, he doesn't sense that person, he can then afterwards, he keeps sensing all the empty stalls. And then afterwards, the person asked him, you know, Father, why did you sense all the empty stalls, but then stop when you sense mine? He's like, well, the, I was sensing the empty stalls because those people who are normally there were desirous to be here. Their minds were in church, even though they weren't. But while you were in church, your mind was somewhere else. You weren't actually here, you know. So just because we're standing in church or just because, you know, we're at the mall or something, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't mean that we have to that we're doing something good or we're doing something neutral or doing something bad, depending on where we are. But what's important is what's going on in our mind. Where is our mind dwelling in those moments? So saying 21. She also said, just as treasure that is exposed loses its value, so a virtue which is known vanishes. Just as wax melts when it is near fire, so the soul is destroyed by praise and loses all the results of its labor. So here she's talking about you know, all those things, good things that we do. The moment we try to make them known to someone, they're all gone. Any reward we might have received, you know, that's our reward. You know, we... Uh, our Lord teaches the same thing, you know. He says that, uh, you know, those, those people, they have the reward already, you know, rather we need to keep things hidden so that when the time comes and all things will be revealed, then we can get our reward. You know, just like we were talking about earlier, this life is not for rewards. It's the next life that's for rewards. And we have to persevere through this life to get to the rewards of the next life. Um, but, uh, you know, when we want to say, you know, what the great thing we did or, you know, how we overcame this or that um, and make something out of ourselves that, you know, necessarily maybe we're not, you know, we've lost any good that might have come from what happens. And she, you know, this, this idea that she says, just as treasure that is exposed loses its value. You know, just think about what they, what people often do with great treasure, you know, with, you know, beautiful jewelry and stuff. What do they normally do? They don't keep it out. They hide it. <laughs> you put it in a safe. You know, it's the same thing that we do with virtues. Even though these things are so beautiful or whatever, expensive, <clears throat> they're, uh, they're always hidden. It's the same thing we should do with, uh, you know, our own personal um, growth. I mean, we obviously we can talk to certain 
certain people about this. We can talk to our spouses. We can talk to our priests, our spiritual father, you know, where we're trying to learn how to, you know, uh, navigate and do more or whatever. But, you know, just you know, telling our friend over coffee, you know, the other day, <laughs> you know, we're not going to, we're not going to reap that reward. Saying 23. She also said, my children, we all want to be saved, but because of our habit of negligence, we swerve away from salvation. You know, I think this is a, this is a great de description of many people today, including myself. Um, I feel like a lot of times that is, we all want to be saved, of course, but, you know, very few of us actually want to put the work in that it requires, you know. Um, we don't, we're, we're, we're negligent of the things that are required, that the Lord requires of us to, uh, you know, grab hold of and um, that great gift that he gives us. You know, it's not, I mean, it's a free gift of salvation from him, but that free gift requires something of us it's not just thank you may I have another you know it's thank you and now because of this free gift I'm going to change everything about me and live in accordance with that gift but you know oftentimes we're kind of lazy and we don't want to do that um, so let's uh, you know don't let, you know, these temporary trials and aches and pains and, you know, um, the tiredness that some things might bring. Don't let that affect what you do as much as you can. Rather, remember and try to keep in your mind that the reward comes at the end. We first have to do the work. Okay, we got two more. Saying 26. She also said, Just as one cannot build a ship unless one has some nails, so it is impossible to be saved without humility. So she's saying that humility is the thing that holds it all together. You know? all the good stuff that we do and you know even the bad stuff that we do and being humble in that and humbling ourselves to confess it to get back up you know all that aids in our salvation is held together by that greatest of virtues humility it keeps us uh, in our right mind so that um, we don't shipwreck. And lastly, 27. She also said, there is grief that is useful, <clears throat> and there is grief that is destructive. The first sort consists in weeping over one's own faults and weeping over the weakness of one's neighbors in order not to destroy one's purpose and attach oneself to the perfect good. But there is also a grief that comes from the enemy, full of mockery, which some call Ikedia. This spirit must be cast out, mainly by prayer and psalmody. So Ikedia is like, um, it's, uh, it's not actually like a grief that she's saying, but it's kind of like a lackadaisical laziness kind of thing. You know, when we hear in uh, Psalm 90, the demon of noonday, you know, you hear, you'll hear this psalm in the funeral and during um, Great Compline. Um, when it's, but when we say demon of noonday, you know, that's what many interpreters are saying. It's this demon of laziness, of Akedia. Um, and so... She says there's a grief that's useful. You know, that is to um, 
weeping, being grieved over our faults and how we've offended God and others, and then weeping over, you know, when our neighbors fall and we be over their sins. Not that we want to, we're not trying to expose them, but we're just trying to, um, in a way, this weeping is kind of like an intercession. Um, but on the other hand, she said there's this grief that comes from the enemy. Um, and this is the spirit of Akedia, which is this lackadaisical, kind of, um, in a way, downtrodden. You're kind of just, you know, how you, you f- sometimes, you know, you feel just kind of like you can't get up and do anything sometimes. Maybe this kind of similar thing, but it's more of a, I guess, you know, spiritual um, aspect in our life. Um, she says, we get rid of that by prayer and psalmody. So, you know, we be, we get rid of it by doing the things that we don't want to do. Um, so that we have to be courageous, get back up, and start plowing through again. Because, um, you know, the only, you know, this happens like when our prayer, when we feel our prayer is dry too. How do we reignite our prayer life and feel like, you know, a warmth and uh, like that our prayers actually mean something except for powering through and continuing to pray? You know, we're never, uh, if we just give up doing things, you know, nothing is going to change. Rather, we have to continue and sometimes even continue um, more and you know increase the things so that we can overcome these things you know what happens is you know when we feel kind of spiritually lazy and or maybe some kind of downtrodden is that God sees us how we are and he's watching us and he no, and then he sees what we do with that and if he sees us continuing and persevering through it, what happens is that eventually he sends us his grace. <clears throat> and it reignites that flame in our hearts, and we can continue on like normal. But if we don't continue, we don't persevere, we're not going to receive that grace. We see this in the life of, and to a great degree, in the life of St. Siloam the Athenite, who lived uh, in the last century. He was the um, spiritual father of Saint Saphroni of Essex um, and he very quickly after becoming monastic kind of advanced um, in the spiritual life so much so that he saw the uncreated light and Christ spoke to him from his, the icon that, he was, that was in his room or in the chapel wherever he was and then afterwards after that experience I want to say it was uh, a number of years, but I'm, I'm probably getting my time wrong, that he was just overcome with temptations, and he didn't have another spiritual experience like that at all. And yet he persevered through it all, and eventually Christ came back to his aid. You know, much like we saw in the first lecture with St. Anthony. You know, he persevered through his battle with the demons, and Christ came to his aid and helped him. Um, St. Siloan persevered, and Christ eventually came, and he saw the uncreated light again. Christ spoke to him again. Um, and this is, um, this is what happens in the spiritual life. You know, we make a little progress, and God wants to see if it's real, so to speak. You know, if we're going to keep pushing forward and keep persevering. And so he might withdraw his grace a little bit so that he wants to see what we do. And then if we keep doing that. He comes and visit us, visits us with his grace again and so that we can grow some more. And, uh, you know, this is kind of uh, 
a way that God will test us sometimes, you know, to allow us to prove ourselves to him. Um, so persevere, keep pushing forward. And that's all I have.